Okay, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. We're very pleased to bring you this weekly series. Since its creation in 1999, the same year the Institute of Medicine issued its landmark report to Air is Human, the Jesse Stewart Richardson Memorial Lecture has sparked and sustained conversation at the University of Virginia on the very sensitive <coughs> subject of medical error. This lectureship had its origins in Mrs. Richardson's untimely death, a result of tragic adverse events in her care at this hospital. Remembering Mrs. Richardson's long career as a school teacher, her family invested funds from her estate in health professional education and patient safety in order to help our medical school and health system underscore health professionals' commitment to care that has the patient at its heart and to explore without fear medical mistakes when they do occur. These annual lectures since 1999 have brought to UVA noted experts on medical error, constructive communication about error, and the quest for quality improvement and patient safety. Collectively, the Richardson Lectures have provided students, clinicians, educators, and administrators with opportunities to learn better how to prevent medical mistakes, address them when they do happen, improve the care provided in complex clinical settings, and assure patients and families of the best possible outcomes. Our Richardson Lecturer for 2013 is internationally known patient safety expert Dr. Peter J. Protovost, whose scientifically validated checklist protocol developed at the Johns Hopkins University is improving patient safety in healthcare institutions across the U.S. and the world. Author of Safe Patients, Smart Hospitals, How One Doctor's Checklist Can Help Us Change Healthcare from the Inside Out, Dr. Pronovost is a most distinguished member of the Johns Hopkins University faculty, with appointments in several schools of that university. He's Senior Vice President for Patient Safety and Quality and the Director of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality for Johns Hopkins Medicine. He's also a Professor of Anesthesiology, Critical Care Medicine, and Surgery in the Medical School, Professor of Health Policy and Management in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Professor in the School of Nursing. You'll find a brief biographical sketch of Dr. Pronovost in your handout. You will also find there a statement that he has completed a disclosure form in which he disclosed no financial conflicts of interest. It's been a pleasure to offer this program in partnership with the Health Systems Patient Safety Committee, chaired by Sue Huerta. It's also a pleasure to have with us today Dr. Don Richardson, Mrs. Richardson's son, and a local physician who also happens to be an alumnus of the School of Medicine. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Pronovost, and I think we're in for a very interesting hour. We'll have some time at the end for you to talk back to him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for hosting me here, and thank you, Dr. Richardson, for your generous support of this lecture. Uh, one of the values that are so needed to improve safety, and unfortunately are so often lacking uh, in safety, is humility. It's a value that I don't think will ever make progress unless we really understand that on a deeper level. Now, I happen to be often and frequently humbled, mostly because I have two kids who uh, keep me quite honest. But uh, a few months ago, I was going to give a talk, and I was in call in the ICU the night before, and I, and I probably looked like I was on call, and I left the ICU early, kind of ragged, and got on a plane and had a very tight time schedule, and they had a distinguished-looking 65-year-old gentleman with a sign that said, Dr. Perna was waiting for me. He's in a suit. And I walked by and said, OK, come on, buddy, it's going to be late. He said, oh, no, no, son. I'm waiting for a famous Johns Hopkins doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK, can I at least go along for the ride? <laughs> now, one of the reasons why I'm so delighted to speak here at UVA, and to this forum in particular, 
is we have a really, really big problem on our hands with patient safety. And I believe deeply that it will be university-based academic medical centers who solve it. Because this is too complicated to come from regulators. It will, it's not going to come from economic incentives. And I don't think it's going to come from just clinicians. It's going to come from clinicians working with psychologists and engineers and the business school trying to put pieces together. And those forums don't happen outside of academic medicine. I, my plea would be at the end of this that you either accelerate or take advantage of those real gifts that you have here within the university. Now, we don't know how many people die needlessly from patient safety. But I'll share to you, uh, this, a few weeks ago I went and saw the movie Lincoln. I don't know if any of you saw that. If you have it, absolutely a treat. It's worth going to see. But there's this powerful scene in the movie where Lincoln is sitting in the Army Hospital in the Potomac, surrounded by mangled bodies, and he looks up and says, when will the bleeding stop? And as you all probably know, the Civil War was the deadliest war of all time. More people died than that than all other wars combined. 620,000 people per year, excuse me, 620,000 per people over four years, 155,000 per year. And yet, patient safety, preventable death, kills more people per year than the Civil War. Think about that for a second. We are having a Civil War or equivalent going on in the U.S. every year since we know it. Now, I said we don't know for sure how many people die, but here's what we do know. We know 100,000 people die from infections. 100,000 people die from DVT and PE. 100,000 people die from diagnostic errors. Indeed, some of our work shows that when you're in an ICU, about 1 in 10 people will die from something other than we're treating them for. Scores of thousands die from not getting evidence-based therapy, 70,000 die from decubitus ulcers, and scores of thousands die from teamwork failures. Now, they're all not preventable, but when we've seen good science led by clinicians, predictably 65 to 70 percent of those events go away. So you add it up, and we conservatively have the third leading cause of death in our hand. We have essentially a civil war going on every year in the U.S. healthcare system. <clears throat> now, my journey, our journey at Johns Hopkins <clears throat> to try to work on this problem began pretty ignoble. I wish I could tell you that there was some grand heroic story, uh, but there unfortunately isn't. Our hospital killed this little girl who looks hauntingly like my daughter, who uh, were born days apart from my daughter, but ironically ended up dying on my birthday. And she died of what started as a catheter infection. An infection, if you don't know these, that kill as many people each year in this country as breast cancer or prostate cancer. So we're talking about a, not some little trivial public health problem, a public health problem the size of breast cancer. And on the one year anniversary of her death, her mother came to our hospital and said, Peter, could you tell me that my daughter would be less likely to die now than she was a year ago? And I suspect, like many of you, I started telling her all the stuff we're doing. And as I'm speaking with her, I felt like I was playing that whack-a-mole game. I was watching myself because I had no science, I had no theory, I had no strategy, and most importantly, I had no data. And so I stopped and said, you know, Sorrell, I can't. I can't tell you you're safer, but you deserve an answer and we'll work to give you one. Now at the time, our rates of these infections at Johns Hopkins were sky high. High enough that I would say publicly we should be shut down if they were that high. But at the time, I was one of those doctors causing those infections. And like you, I certainly didn't want to harm people, but I didn't know any better. I just assumed when you do big operations, you care for sick people, stuff happens. It was we call in the inevitable bucket. So we looked to change that. And we went to the Centers for Disease Control and got their guideline, a guideline that's elegant, that's scholarly, but frankly near useless as a clinician at the bedside because it's 200 pages long. It tells you to do 95 things. doesn't prioritize which one is most important. 
And no wonder why we, it doesn't really help us. So we called out from that a really simple five-item checklist. Simple things like wash your hands, clean your skin with chlorhexidine, avoid the femoral site, use full bearer precautions, and ask every day if I still need these catheters. And when we looked, we were doing those things, I was doing those things 30% of the time. Not because I didn't want to, not because I need to be bullied or have management come down on me, because it was hard for me to do those. You see, nobody stored the equipment together. It was all in different places. Caps were in one place, masks were in another, gowns were in another. And when I went to get the equipment and half the time it wasn't stopped, I made what in my mind was a rational economic decision. I said, okay, do I run down the hall to get this equipment, which will be 10 minutes I spend not treating another patient or doing something else because our days are really busy, or do I just skip it and go without it? And the time I don't spend in another patient is real and immediate. If I skip it, the infection's invisible and in the future, and too often clinicians say, stick with the real problem. So we got a cart. We took eight steps down to one, assigned someone to stock it, compliance with the checklist went from 30 to 75 percent, and infection rates went from 11, we measure them per 1,000 catheter days, down to five. Good, but not good enough. So we pulled the doctors and nurses together, and I said, hey, when we put these catheters in, you know, we're going to sometimes forget to use this checklist, and we're only using 70 percent of the time. So nurses, I want you to work with our doctors. And if the doctors don't comply with the checklist, you are completely empowered to stop takeoff. That is, you can make them go back and fix the defect. And folks, I literally caused World War III in our hospital. <laughs> and that's when I learned this ugly lesson that if we don't start addressing this culture thing, we're never going to make profits. You see, the nurses said, Peter, there's no way you, I'm going to question the doctors. It's not my job to be the policeman, and if I do, I'll get my head cut off. And the reality is they're right. They too often do get their head bit off. And the doctor said, Peter, there's no way a nurse can question me in public. It makes me look like I don't know something, right? To which I said, welcome to the human race. I didn't think your name is Jesus, but <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. But there is an opening for the Pope if you'd like a job. <laughs> right? But what was striking is nobody debated the evidence, right? This wasn't a discussion of, should we do this? It was a discussion about power and politics, right? It was a discussion about ego, about culture. So we pulled the doctors and nurses together and said, is it tenable that we harm patients at Johns Hopkins? And everyone said, of course, Peter, no, we can't do that. And I said, and do you agree that these items on the checklist are evidence-based, that we ought to be doing them all the time for every patient? Yes, of course, Peter, that's the way we should be doing this all the time. So, okay, then our egos can't get in the way. So, nurses, I need you to speak up. And doctors, we have permission to forget to wash our hands. We have permission to not remember to cap. But we don't have permission to needlessly put patients at risk. So if you forget, it's okay, we're human, we're going to forget. But if someone sees you, they're going to speak up and you will go back and fix the defect. And nurses, I know you're worried about getting your head bit off. So doctors, let me be really clear. If you disagree with the evidence, let's have a conversation now. But you just told me you agreed. So if you give the nurses flack, nurses page me any time of day, day or night. Right? Our egos aren't getting in the way of, of what's doing right for the patients. Now, I wasn't paged. Compliance went up from 70 to 95%. Infection rates went down from 5 to 2. Uh, unheard of performance for us. But we didn't quit there. We applied what I call the third principle of the science of safety. The first being standardized work. The second being create independent checks for the things that are important. The third is learning from our defects. So we started looking into every infection and changing our mental models from these things are inevitable to they're preventable. And what did we find? Well, we found that half of the infections weren't placed in the ICU. They were placed in the ED or the operating room. And we hadn't brought the program there. So we did. Infection rates came down to one. We then realized that the remaining infections had nothing to do with how we inserted the catheter. They had to do with how we maintained it. There were patients who had catheters for a really long time. So we started looking at those work processes, and not surprisingly, they, they were just like we were with catheter insertion, completely unstandardized, no feedback, no standard training. So we tightened that up, and they went to zero. But from literally being amongst the worst in the country <clears throat> to most of our ICUs going a year without an infection. I then got a phone call from the Michigan Hospital Association 
that said, hey, Peter, we're putting a safety program in our state, and we wonder if you'd want to work with us to, put, to help reduce infections. We, we published this stuff and said, oh, are you at all interested in doing any of this? And my first response was, uh, you know, I'm an academic doc. I don't really do this kind of quality stuff. Go hire some consultants. Right? And then Sorrel King, as they have this ability to keep you humble, said, Peter, you're licking a problem the size of breast cancer. What the heck do you mean you're not going to go with them? Right? You, you think you found a cure to something. You have an obligation to go do it. Right? And at the time, kind of implementation science or just uh, healthcare delivery science was really immature and there really wasn't good measurement. And so he said, okay, I'm willing to do this as long as the hospitals can commit to submitting valid data. Because at the end of the day, if I'm going to look Sorrel King in the eye, it's hard to do that without having valid data. And as you probably know, most quality improvement projects have about 60 to 80 percent missing data. And you don't need to be a statistician to know about the only thing you can conclude with that is that we have a lot of missing data. Uh, but you certainly can't make an inference that things are better. So they committed to that, and we went to work. But I'll tell you, their politics and the culture was striking. You see, I'm an anesthesiologist, ICU doc, and the infectious disease docs were saying, what the heck is this critical care guy doing in our space? This is our problem. We've been working on it for 20 years. We don't want you in here. I said, well, it doesn't look like what you've been doing has worked all that much, so why don't we work together? <laughs> They're pushing me out, because it sure seems we could probably use some help. And the University of Michigan academics were saying, hey, we don't want this Hopkins guy coming into our playground. You know, this is our state. We should be leading this. And I said, well, you sure should, but either put together your own program then or let's get working together because we're killing a lot of people here. We have a civil war going on. Well, we worked through all those politics. We committed to, to collect good data. And which remarkably, within three months, infection rates across the whole state, across the whole state, were cut in half. Within six months, the median was zero, the mean was down by 60% or 66%, and these results stayed low for now seven years. An unheard of performance. But importantly, we said, okay, if we really reduced infections, did we save lives? So one of our doctoral students and I looked at any Medicare patient admitted to a Michigan ICU, what their mortality was compared to the mortality of similar patients in the 11 surrounding states. And what we showed was, Prior to our program, their mortality was exactly the same. Our program started in the two curves split, and it's still splitting when we did the analysis with the most recent data. So the bottom line is, if you're a Medicare patient admitted anywhere to a Michigan ICU, you have a 10% lower risk of dying than if you're admitted to one of the surrounding states. We showed that the average hospital saved about $1.5 million. Most of them are real small hospitals. The large ones saved more. The insurers saved over $200 million. The culture improved throughout the whole state by about 50%. These are data from surveys that measure safety culture. There's a couple of valid tools out there that you can use. And culture amongst all these ICUs improved dramatically. So we then, with funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, with some philanthropy, and with partnership with the American Hospital Association, the CDC, and state hospital association, including the Virginia Hospital Association, we spread this program state by state across the, the country over the last two years. And um, you may have seen the CDC issued a report. These infections now, just over the last two years, are down by 40%. From when we started in Michigan, they're down by about 70%. And now 1,500 hospitals have an infection rate of one, which if I had told you five years ago that you could have an academic medical center or any ICU, frankly, with a rate that low, I'd have been laughed. It's impossible, Peter. Absolutely cannot do this, right? And one of, it's one of the great lessons about this is when we started, the Johns Hopkins goal was to be the mean of the CDC, right? And it was hurting us. We were anchored to poor performance because the mean was based on everyone using the checklist 30% of the time, right? If the mean was based on 100%, we would get that. But most of our benchmarks are based on really broken systems and they're anchoring us to poor performance rather than spurring us to do what's really possible. Now, this program got labeled as it's a, a checklist, but I want to hopefully impart with you that it's much more complicated, right? And it's really based on some good theory of implementation science that did three things. 
It had a robust measurement of infection rates that was key, and importantly, using data that doctors and nurses believe are valid. Collecting data, like many administrative measures that clinicians don't believe are valid, are frankly a waste of time because they'll never use it to improve. Second, it had a model, a conceptual model, of putting evidence into practice, that it, this model that we call TRIP, and was published in the BMJ. But fundamentally, it says, when we want to put evidence into practice, to try to address those problems for which there is empiric evidence, problems like DVT or blood from infections or pneumonia or aspiration, we first need to clarify what the behaviors are and then find barriers to those and then work with clinicians to make sure we mitigate those barriers and do this. But it's not just telling George to try harder because the problem generally isn't that George doesn't care. George cares deeply about these harms. And, and yet, our whole public policy model is based on an economic framework that says, if we just pay you a nickel more, you will somehow be more willing to do these things. And you probably know the evidence says that that hasn't moved the needle much, if any, at all in quality. And it shouldn't surprise us, because these changes work through social norms much more than saying, I'm going to try to motivate George by paying him more. But the third leg of this program is this program that we call CUSP, that it's a culture safety program. And what it was developed on was some keen insights to say in virtually every quality variable you look at, so whether it's patient engagement or, patient, or employee engagement, patient satisfaction, hand washing, core measure compliance, <coughs> infection rates, the variation among units within a hospital is about six to eight fold more than the variation among hospitals. So you look across hospitals and none of us look all that different, which is one of the problems with consumers saying, how do you rate hospitals? But you peel the onion and you look at the variation in your ED from your OB to your surgery, and there's literally six fold variation. Then you could probably feel it. You walk into a unit and there's a culture of commitments to safety and quality, or there's not a commitment. And we realized we needed an infrastructure at that unit level to try to drive improvement. And so we formed these unit level teams and they went through a very st structured process, but fundamentally what it boils down to is say, we trust you as clinicians to know what your hazards are and to work to fix them. You see, there's what we call common problems like these bloodstream infections that are all over the place that we need to have standard measures for. But most of the things that worry us as doctors and nurses and clinicians and administrators aren't always those things we measure. There's things that are unique to your units, those hazards that happen every day, and we need tools to address those. But we have so disempowered our work staff that they don't feel they have the authority to solve these, these problems, and we haven't necessarily invested them in the training and the science for how to do this. There's this great story where some of you may have seen the Hopkins 24-7, where we let the TV crews into a surgical morbidity and mortality conference. You think your risk managers are nervous <laughs> letting them into our morbidity and mortality conference. But there was this most poignant scene that highlighted what is so great about American medicine and what is so naive. There was a case of there was a delayed transport from getting patients from the emergency room up to the operating room. It, when at the time it was about an eight floor elevator ride. And a senior surgeon is asking a junior surgeon, what is he going to do differently next time? Right? And the junior surgeon is literally visibly shaking. And he said, I'm going to push harder next time. I'm going to push harder. And I watched that and said, how blessed are we to have doctors and nurses that care that much? I have no doubt if that doctor needed to carry the patient up the stairs, he would. That's how deeply he cares. But I also say, how naive. Because the only systems that that doctor thinks he could change are his hands and the patient. And everyone else he's battling against. Right? We're not on a team. It's me against the world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push harder. Right? And I, I know you're more gentlemanly down here in the south. But <laughs> up the road, when a surgeon says, I'm going to push harder next time, Behaviorally, what do you think that might translate into? <laughs> right. Go, 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 go. A, a tantrum, right? A completely ineffective system approach. Right? A system approach might be maybe we ought to have the security guard hold a trauma beeper, and when it goes off, their job is to hold the elevator and don't let it go to the trauma attending says it could go. Right? That would be a system approach. But we have system blind clinicians. 
who don't even think of those tools because we haven't empowered them to change systems. So all they think that I have is I'm Atlas holding up the world. It's me against the world, and I'm going to push hard, right? So part of this program is educating people to see systems, to, to realize that the way you're going to get impact and improvement is by changing systems. We then try to identify hazards by asking staff really simply, how is the next patient going to be harmed? See, us, like you, have error reporting system, and we have sentinel events, and all those methods of identifying hazards are important. But probably the most powerful one is just asking the clinicians, how is someone going to be harmed here next? You see, there's overwhelming data from our cognitive psychologists that say what clinicians worry about are really the real risks, and we ought to pay heed to them. But too often, we haven't listened to what their concerns are. We then partner executives with these teams. So this is very different than what you may have heard about executive walk-arounds that we're doing, where in our culture, an executive walks around once a year and shakes hands and kisses babies like Bill Clinton. It's very much seen through that. It's the dog and pony show, right? In this model, the executive becomes part of the team. They meet monthly with them. They review what the hazards are. They make sure they have resources to fix things. And they hold them accountable that they're actually learning from defects. And then they get tasked to learn from one defect a month or a quarter. And that might sound like it's too little. Why aren't you learning from every defect? And the reality is, as a clinician, I spend my day recovering from defects. It's unrealistic to think you're going to stop and step back and fix everything. Because fixing things takes resources. We recover from many things, and we're really, really good at it. But we don't often learn from mistakes. Learning being defined as we step back, change a system, and improve things. And that's what takes resources and, and teams. For those of you who are into training programs, our fellows in critical care and our residency in anesthesia and now surgery and medicine all have to do this learning from defect. And they uniformly say it's the best educational experience they have because they work with nurse managers and administrators and nurses and solving problems. And they go through all the issues that all of us in management do where they get scope creep, they want to boil the ocean, we have to narrow it down, the politics of getting change. I mean, it's a real world education of how do you work to change a, 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 a system. Now, a big part of this was the technical work, right? The items on the checklist were really important and they had to be right. We had to measure infection rates right. But an even bigger part was what I would call the adaptive work. This is a framework that comes from a Ron Heifetz at the Kennedy School of Government. And what it's a brilliant model of leadership. What it says is that whenever you're trying to change something, there's two components to it. There's a technical component, a science, and there's an adaptive component, a part that requires people to get buy-in, that requires culture change. It's essentially leadership and buy-in. And both are important. But if you look at why projects fail, and think about European projects. You think they more likely fail for adaptive problems or the, excuse me, technical problems or adaptive? Yeah, almost always for adaptive problems, right? And, and yet, if you look at where do we spend our resources, where do you spend all your focus? All in the technical. Sorry, most of us don't even have tools to try to lead the adaptive change. I want to share with you a couple metaphors. I use metaphors much like the Bible's told in parables, because these are really hard concepts. There's no checklist for how to lead change. But a couple principles, I think, might be illuminating. First principle, I would say, is this concept of be unwavering in the hill you're going to climb, but humble enough to invite everybody to help you climb. So let me share with you a brief story. When I was 17 years old, I was on a camping trip. And there are about 20, 24 boys who are going to be climbing a mountain. We're sitting by a fire the night before trying to plan our routes. And there are a number of different mountains we can climb. And we were broken up into three groups, and each group had a counselor. First counselor comes up and says, you see that hill over there? That's what we're going to go up. And then gave the boys an hour-long lecture of how they're going to do it. And there was no passion, and they failed. <laughs> Second lecture, the second counselor came up, I think he may have been high, and said, hey dudes, there's a lot of cool hills you can climb around here. Why don't you pick one you want to go on and go have some fun? Right? No passion, they didn't make it. The third counselor, probably the best leadership lesson I had in my life, the group I was in, he said, you see that hill over there? That's the Cirque of Towers. Now, I'm not sure we're going to be able to make it, 
But if we do, boy, is it going to have a great reward. It's got an amazing view, and you're going to feel great. Now, to do it, we're going to have to pull together like we never did before. We're going to have to help each other. We'll have to plan together. I'm not sure how we're going to do it. We'll have to figure it out together. And that guy had a bunch of revved up boys who <coughs> undoubtedly made it up the hill. And when I look at healthcare leadership, I'm constantly seeing those first two style of leaders. But either leaders who are top down and micromanaging and don't know the nuances is clinical, or perhaps even more often, the leaders who say, hey, George, I, I know you're trying really hard. Keep it up, but you're not yours. Our infection rates are sky high, right? And no accountability. And finding that balance between kind of unwavering in the goal, we will achieve this, and yet saying, I need your help to do this is a really tough balance. Second metaphor is, I would say, surface the real and the perceived loss. So let me ask you questions. How many of you believe your doctors here resist change? <laughs> so even down south, right? And, and we say this all the time, most people resist change. Now, let, let's unpack that concept a little bit. And I'll ask you, if I were to give your doctors, now you may be paid better than we are, the Virginia State Lottery ticket for $500 million, would that change most of their lives? Probably pretty dramatically, unless they're independently wealthy, right? How many of you would think you'd say, no, no, Peter, you keep that lottery ticket. I hate change. Change is bad. I don't want to change. You keep your $500 million, right? Not going to happen. Because it's not change people fear. It's loss. Right? It's loss. Positive change, bring it on, baby. Loss, I don't want it. And loss has two components. It has a very real component that's often minimal. I'm asking you to use a check or something trivial part of work, but it has a perceived loss that grows like a cancer if you don't manage the message. Right? And we often aren't on top of managing the, the, the message. And that's so often we go awry because we don't have a containing vessel to communicate with people. <coughs> so another metaphor that I ask you to use is avoid monsters in the bathroom. So another true story. My, I have a 15-year-old son and a just actually last week turned 13-year-old daughter. But when my son was in third grade, he came home from school one day and said, Daddy, 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 I'm afraid to go into the bathroom. And I said, OK, Ethan, yeah, fine, whatever. Next day, comes home from school, same thing. Daddy, I'm afraid to go in the bathroom. I said, OK, there's clearly something going on here. So I called the teacher and said, hey, help me understand what's going on in school. And the teacher chuckled and said, oh, we just installed automatic flush toilets, and nobody told the kids. <laughs> now, we laugh, but think away the, about the way we roll change programs out through African medical centers, right? Whether it's an EMR or a new change program, and you're a private practice doc, or you're a nurse in the, in the trenches, and you're not at the executive meetings, and we wonder why we get rebellion, right? I mean, it's monsters in the bathroom. Completely understandable human nature is because they, they weren't part of this, right? And you need a mechanism to contain people. When, when we first put this program in, I'll never forget, we you know, had all the hospitals in Michigan together, and each hospital had a doctor and nurse or a couple of them. We trained them. We talked about the nurses stopping takeoff if the doctors don't comply. And that night and over the next couple of days, I got more hate mail from doctors saying, you're causing a revolt in Michigan. Nurses are overstepping their bounds. What's going on? The nurses are telling us we can't put in central lines. Nothing at all from the truth, but big mistake I made. We didn't give them tools or we didn't manage the message. So what was a perfectly legitimate intervention got mixed, misread and branded as this animal farm revolt that was going on in, in here. So make sure you have a containing vessel to know how you're going to manage this. The last metaphor that I would share with you, and I think it's probably the most important, is value the dissenter. Or framed another way, is seek to understand rather than judge. You see, most of the time when a doctor or a nurse, perhaps a more junior manager, resists these change efforts, we automatically judge them that they're just blocking what's great. We know better, and we're going to bulldoze over them, right? That doctor, we're not going to resist him. We'll work around him. Oftentimes, don't even involve him in the change. We just go straight to nurses because doctors are too hard to deal with anyways. But what I've realized is that we all want what's best for the patient. These doctors don't want to harm patients. We all care deeply about what's good for patients. And when they resist, 
though admittedly it's sometimes not expressed in an emotionally intelligent way, which is you got to get past that piece. But if you could do that, almost always there's a nugget of truth behind it. Right? There's some harm that we didn't think of, like if I do this, it's going to cause me to do something else, and we need to defend against that. There's some barrier that it's really hard to do that we can make it easier. And so when you have doctors resist, uniformly this conversation is scripted is to say, you know, George, I know you're committed to what's right for your patients. So I was wondering if you could help me understand what you're seeing about using this checklist or this program. Because from my eyes, it's going to help your patients. The outcomes are going to be better. So you must be seeing something I'm not. Help me understand it. And almost always, it's either, oh, what are you talking about, Peter? I'm on board with this. I just didn't understand what you wanted me to do. Or, hey, there's this risk. It, you know, by doing this, it's going to you know, put this potential risk. It's OK, well, what if we did this to mitigate that risk? Would that get your butt in? But if you don't manage this adaptive change, you will automatically and guaranteed struggle with these kinds of types of change efforts that we're doing. Now, one other metaphor that was really fascinating, it's a great uh, tool that we also used, is this concept of peer-to-peer -peer review. Uh, I wish I could say we thought of it, but we borrowed it from the nuclear industry. You see, after Three Mile Island, the CEOs of all the nuclear industry got together and said, if there's another nuclear accident, we are done. The public will not tolerate us to use nuclear power, and we don't believe the regulatory agencies are going to solve it. They're needed to police the bad apples, but we got to own the problem. This right, right? Political commentary, I don't think American hospital CEOs have stepped up to that place to realize that our very existence is threatened if you want to have some autonomy. So they said, well, what can we do? And they put together this process of peer-to-peer -peer review, where one nuclear facility would go view another. And it was done by the operators, so in this case, doctors or nurses or administrators who had frontline knowledge. They used validated assessment tools that they went and developed. But it was totally done in a culture of learning, not judging. And what was seen was completely confidential. So if I walked around your ICUs and we did this at UVA, I'd be ruthlessly honest and transparent and say, here's what I saw, but I also would go nowhere else but to help you. So there was no ding in you, I'm going to get you. But a very different concept than a regulator of the Joint Commission coming in who can shut you down and creates a culture of hiding things rather than surfacing what, what, our, what our mistakes are. So we pilot tested this to say, what was it that allowed a hospital to get to zero infections and what allowed some not to get this here. Because we figured there's not something magical about this checklist. Right? There's a whole, what we call this cascade of accountability that would need to happen if we really allowed this work to happen. So we did this half day visit, fairly scripted. We would go in, we'd interview the CEOs, we'd interview the infection prevention and the quality staff, we'd interview the ICU director and nurse manager. Then we'd go walk around the ICU getting what I call ground truth, talking to the nursing staff, asking them questions, talking to docs, looking at things. We put our notes together, and then we'd invite all those groups back together and transparently say, here's what we found. Right? So pretty risky, frankly, for the CEOs to be not knowing what we're going to say. But what we found was absolutely breathtaking. There wasn't one magic bullet that allowed great quality to happen, but rather there is a series of very explicit practices that need to happen. The first was the CEO was unwavering in their commitment to zero, and they knew what their performance was. And we walked into some hospitals, and the CEO would say, our goal is to be low on these infections. And I'd say, well, what are your rates? I, mean, I don't know. I, my quality person knows that. But I, I think we're doing OK. Guaranteed they want zero. right? As opposed to the CEO who said, our goal is to be zero. We're 699 days without an infection. And I message it every day. Right? Doesn't surprise me that they're, they're there. Right? There's a very clear measurement system. Also, they were zero if the ICU manager and nurse manager and doc were the ones accountable, not the infection preventionist. So the infection preventionist doesn't work doing these things. They can't control the other docs or nurses. But too often, they're the ones who we scapegoat. They need to work and provide the technical support. But if that ICU director said, my goal is to be zero, and I knew what the rates were, again, very likely to be zero. If as several places walked in, the ICU director said, you know, my quality person is looking at that, but I think we had a problem two or three years ago, but it's not so much now. Guaranteed weren't zero. 
if they made it easy to comply with the checklist, this is why this CUSP program of getting ground truth is so key. Can't tell you the number of hospitals I'd go in, the CEOs and the, the quality leaders would say, oh yeah, Peter, rah, rah, we're using your checklist, we got that line card thing, we got this stuff going. And I'd walk in and the nurses and doctors in the ICU would say, well, yeah, they bought us this piece of junk that the wheel doesn't roll, and it sits in a corner and no one uses it. So technically they have it, but they're not getting ground truth, or nobody stocks it, so it's not meeting their needs, right? And you have to get ground truth to create this chain of accountability. And so these things, there wasn't one, but there was a series of actions that if they all happened together, really led to us to, to get uh, to zero. We partnered with some anthropologists and sociologist to say what was magic about this program and this perhaps is the most insightful thing that I think we could all take away from this. See, if you look at changing behavior in a university like yours that has such a prestigious psychology school, I'm very leery of commenting on changing behavior as a hack psychologist, but if you know, there's a great book that I read by Doug Sedman called How who said, you know, fundamentally, there's three ways you can change behavior. You could coerce through regulation or management, so you will do this. You can try to motivate by economic incentives, or you could inspire through social norms. Right, so take, for example, if I have to give a plug to my Ravens winning the Super Bowl, at a football game, uh, did you ever see anyone doing the wave? Right, so it started in 1982 with crazy, crazy George Henderson doing the wave when the Oakland A's were playing the Yankees. And the A's were down, and uh, Crazy George, professional cheerleader, said, okay, I really need to do something to make something different. And he gives this brilliant description of how, well, I started by banging on the drums. And when I do that, I get the attention of someone in front of me who was really looking. And then I gave them some simple rules. Simple rules were throw your hands up in sequential and whoever stops, boo them. Right? So you get some <laughs> feedback mechanism. And I had linked notes. So in a stadium, as you know, the sections are all linked. So there was, you know, the people you sit around, and many of you have seasons, take us to games, you kind of get to know each other, they're a tribe. The people in other sections, you don't know really well, but you're, you're linked. And that spreads like wildfire. Right now, imagine trying to spread the wave. And as you know, after the wave happens, you're energized in the game, right? When you're, you cheer louder, you're gearing for the home team, but the motivation isn't about Crazy George. It's about the team, right? It's about doing something together that we can't do alone. And imagine trying to do the wave by saying, hey, throw your hands up because I'm more powerful, right? Or I have a higher position, or I'm stronger than you, right? And spreading that, a movement like that, would never happen. Or, hey, here's 20 bucks. Okay, everyone do the wave, we'll give you 20 bucks and keep it going. Right, these kind of movements that we need in healthcare, I don't think are gonna happen by extrinsic forces. Certainly the data says they haven't done anything yet. They're going to be happening by intrinsic motivation, just like the wave is by inspiring clinicians to do this kind of science. And that is, I think, what has led to great changes like the civil rights movement, if you ever read anything about the spread of um, some great churches like Saddleback Church, how it's spread by people having these home Bible studies that spread. And what they all seem to have in common is a small group of people with very tight bonds who are guided by some simple rules who have very weak connections with many other units. And so when we looked at why did this program spread across the country, that's exactly what it had. Those people in each ICU had really strong bonds. And we already talked about this culture within a unit. They, they, they care deeply about each other and their patients. And they had some pretty simple rules. Put in this checklist for infections, measure infections, do a CUSP program. And we connected them at first to a state level, then to a na national level to try to share your learning together. We bored upon that to do the same work within our health system. So now we have six hospitals in our health system and a large primary care group that we connect through what we call these clinical communities that exact same way. So we have all of our hospitalist programs, for example, all of our ICUs, all of our NICUs are all working together. Their task is very simple, to partner with patients, their families, and others 
to eliminate preventable harm, to optimize patient experience and outcomes, and to reduce waste. But how they do that is up to them. We provide them with some methodological input through the institute we run. We provide them with some data. But it's fundamentally the clinicians who own this problem. And this isn't a Paula Anna issue. The accountability is they have to present twice a year to our board of trustees. We help them get the presentation, but in this case, like George, the head of hospitals presents what they did. George could either sink or swim right. You could say, we chose to do nothing in quality and safety, or you could say, here's what we did. George, if he wants to keep working, would not say he did nothing. But fundamentally, they, they still have this autonomy, and it's a brilliant method. And it really came from, these in, from the anthropologists to say, Peter, the reality is this work probably had nothing to do with the checklist. Not that the checklist is important, but people are smart enough to figure it out. It had everything to do with changing social norms. You see, just like when I was harming that little girl from infections, I didn't want to. But in my mental model, stuff happens, right? These infections were in the inevitable video. Care for sick patients and, and stuff happens. And it was only when that switch went off to say, not only are these preventable, but I am capable of doing something about it. It's my problem that real, that real change happens. Because doctors and nurses have really strong individual accountability. But what we're accountable for is really myopic, right? I stick a tube in the wrong place, or my stitches fall off. I, I'm accountable for that. A DVT, PE, infections, diagnostic that many other clinicians are involved in, well, it's not really directly related to me. And so we have this diffusion of accountability and we need to begin to change that. So what might be some take home messages for you as you think about how you would answer Sorrel King's question, is Josie gonna be less likely to die? Well one, I think we have to be guided by science. That this work isn't just something that's evangelism and rah rah go do it. Yes, inspiration is important, but it's fundamentally grounded in science. And you, with this rich university, you know, absolutely should and are leaders in this because you can draw from engineering and psychology and arts and sciences and the business school and the law school because that literally is what it's going to take to pull these disciplines together. Not the institute that I run, we have 18 different disciplines all together. Now, it makes management a nightmare because they all speak different languages and so thinking about getting ethicians and engineers speaking together, not the easiest thing to do. But once you, you can create people aligned towards this common goal, indeed, we kind of frame it as this transdisciplinary research. And the difference between interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary is interdisciplinary is different disciplines working on a common problem, but each staying within their own mental model. So if I'm an engineer, I think engineering. If I'm an economist, I think economic incentives. If I'm a clinician, I think clinical medicine. If I'm an epidemiologist, I think measurement. What transdisciplinary is, is different disciplines working on a common problem united in a common framework. So we draw upon all those disciplines, but we're leveraging those different social norms and team norms and epidemiology so we move the needle in a much more effective way than each pulling their own little thing that you might, like a puppet, move in different directions. So led by science. It's got to have good measurement to it. And again, that's why academic medicine needs to be leading this. It absolutely has to be led by clinicians, that we have to own this problem. I don't think regulators are going to solve it. I don't think economic incentives are going to solve it. Yes, they could supplement. They could accelerate our efforts. But if we don't fundamentally say, this is our problem, it's the problem isn't going to be solved. And frankly, we, as an industry, have been too much like ostriches for the last decade. I don't think, given that there's a civil war going on every year, that we've stepped up the, the degree that we have to. And so policymakers are right for coming down on us. And, and they will continue and have an obligation to continue until we step up and give it the due that this that the size of this problem is absolutely needed. And lastly, I think we need to start to think about a quality management infrastructure. You see, when I look around and say, why, why is this happening if I just say doctors and nurses care so much about uh, the, the patients that we care for. How could this happen? And the reality is, if you look at the structure for your financial infrastructure, right? you have a very tight 
reporting system. I suspect, like most organizations, you'll have a university finance, you have a finance within the medical school, every department has a finance, and there's very clear monthly reviews of performance, often dual reporting, so the departmental finance person might report jointly to a department chair and a hospital finance, and hospital finance will report to the CEO and to someone in the university. Very tight linkages. Look at how we measure quality and safety and, and work to improve quality, and it's like the Wild West. There's absolutely no, no infrastructure. We don't have people with the skills. Uh, you would never think of having someone without an MBA or finance training to do finance, but we all the time put people in our quality and safety roles who don't really have training in the science, and, and that really, really uh, needs to change. So I think any of you are familiar with the Kitty Genevieve story? So it's a fascinating story from sociology that uh, evolved out of the 1960s where Kitty Genovese was brutally murdered in Brooklyn in front of a crowd of, of uh, people. And nobody came to her help despite her screams for, for uh, help. And so it became a great study for ethicians and sociologists to say, are we just all deranged as humans? Like, how could people not hear this? Here's one screaming and not come to her aid. And what they realized is that there's this very innate human attribute that if no one has this responsibility, nobody steps up. But yet when we're the only one there, we'll routinely jump into a burning building or you know, put our lives on the line for our friends if it's clear that I'm the one accountable. And I think in healthcare, if I were to say in any one of your units or department, who owns safety? Who's really responsible? I suspect you want to get an answer. You'd say everybody is, which in my world it, it means nobody is. And we've been modeling this quality management infrastructure much like a fractal. I don't know if you know, but fractals are these structures that exist like a fern that have this elegant way in nature of allowing horizontal learning, so connecting everyone at the same level, but also vertical learning for accountability. So we have this fractal structure that says, there's a quality infrastructure at our system level, at a hospital level, every department, and every unit will have someone named. And every unit has to meet monthly with all the entities in the unit below them to get organizational learning. So in our system, the hospital level, the different departments get together. And in our board meetings, it's not me or the quality person who presents the data, it's the department chairs. And then every department chair meets monthly with all their unit cusp teams to say what they're doing on and, and what they're working. And we have very clear competencies that this kind of three level of training. The base level is what everyone, in my view, who's an employee in healthcare needs to know about quality and safety. And that's this basic of the science of safety. There's a middle layer that those unit level nurses or doc leaders are. And that's mostly training and implementation but not evaluation, and that's what we have put together a 40-hour certificate that has some human factors, some cusps, some implementation science, that trip model, how to lead change, so this training in the adaptive work, and some project management work. And then there's the highest level that our big department or hospital level that has implementation training as well as evaluation training, typically some public health de degree, right? And my sense is it's only going to be with replicating that finance infrastructure that works so well that we're going to be able to really have accountability and own this quality and safety problem. So I'll end with, maybe because I'm a runner, a story of the power of this belief system to make the change that we have. And it's a story that some of you may know of Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. And the story goes, that prior to 1956, when Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, it was the longest standing record of all time. It stood for 2,000 years. And most leading physicians and physiologists at the time said it was physiologically impossible to break the four minute mile. Indeed, many physicians, including physicians at Hopkins, said, you will die if you try to do this, <laughs> right? And it stood until Roger Bannister, a medical student at the time, didn't buy into that, and he broke the four minute mile. And some of you may know that story. What's often not told as part of this is this 2,000 year old record, the next year, 12 more people broke it. 
The year after, 150 people broke in. And now there's high school kids in many states who are at that level, and they're pretty routinely bro broke in. And so I ask you to think, what changed in 1956 to go from never happening to at least happening in, I'd say commonly, but many people doing this? Right? And it could be, as my kids tell me, they all got new sneakers and could run faster, <laughs> but probably not true. Or maybe like going out in baseball, they were doing blood doping and steroids or bicycling, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Or maybe evolution happened and our bodies just evolved, but as you know, two years is way too short on the evolutionary cycle. Now, I think the only thing that changed was their belief system. You see, prior to Roger Bannister, they were told we can't break the four minute mile, and they didn't. They were bound by that. And what Roger Bannister did was free up that potential for all of us to break that mile. And folks, that's what we need to do in healthcare. I think we have a success story with this infection to say we can take a major killer and eliminate it across the whole country. Now, what you need to do with this healthcare system is take not one harm, but all those harms, and make sure we work to eliminate it. Because just like Josie King asked me if her daughter's less likely to die, she wants an answer from every one of you, and I'm confident that you could all give her one. So I'm, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for just a few questions. Um, and I also will say that um, Sorrel King was here a couple of years ago, and we may be separated by time, but you and she make a formidable, inspiring team, so thank you. Would you please identify yourself? Hi, I'm Lacey Colligan. I'm a fellow in the NICU. And I'm, um, I'm really excited to see what you're doing. I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your work as a everyday nurse. And I wanted to and even though we all know we should be doing that, it's hard to measure. So do you think that we're better off just sticking with things that we can measure clearly because we'll get more momentum from them and hope there's some trickle over? Or should we try and tackle everything at once? Yeah. So great uh, question. Do you are the audience here? Is the mic on? So one of the key lessons that we learned in this is that there's different types of safety problems that require different methods and theories. And I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made is treating every problem to tackle with PDSA. It'd be the same as saying every research project is going to use the scientific method, right? At 30,000 foot, that's true, but a study of a diagnostic test or an RCT or an outcomes problem look different. They're based on different theories. One of the reasons why we put this slide is, and, and this is oversimplifying, we, I grade safety problems into two types. One is those things that you could measure that are supported by evidence, like CLABS or other things in the NICU. And for those, we use the, this trip model. But most of the things have no measures, right? They're things that go bump in the night, and they need different methods and theories. And we use this CUSP model. I wouldn't think of doing a program that, that doesn't include both because they're synergistic, right? If you just approach it like an engineering this trip, it doesn't sustain because you don't change culture. But if you only do these and you staff start saying, where's the beat, right? Or a minute, like, did, did I really do anything? And it's hard to sustain it saying, well, I think I'm learning from defects, but at the end of the day, what do I have to show for it? And so typically, a combination of both allows some synergy to say, yeah, there's a lot of things that I'm never going to measure. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make in this field is spending resources measuring poorly when we should just say get over it we're not going to measure it. i'm going to do something because it has enough face validity and then don't pretend i have some bogus measure that isn't really good but the things that i do measure i should measure really accurately right and 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 so i think that's at least how i judge the tension uh, hi so my name is carolyn Englehart. i i teach health policy here and i want to thank you for everything that you do and my students know you. Uh, my question to you is, uh, just fortuitously, in the last couple of days, I read a blog by uh, Robert Walker at UCSF, your colleague on patient safety, and he was actually talking about 
in his blog about changing uh, physician behavior in organizations. Mm -hmm. And what he wrote about was this rising problem of physician burnout. And that with physician burnout, he, he likened it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That if you are still foraging for food, if that's all you can do, you can't do the higher levels of functioning. So I, I wonder, did you see that at Hopkins and other places and how you addressed it so that you could get physician engagement so they could actually have the energy and space to think about change? Yes, so that is a really insightful question. And I would broaden it to say it's not just physician burnout, it's nurse burnout. And in part, we can go on forever, is, you know, one of the, the so in this, We'd be linked with your business school. You know, our main mechanism of controlling healthcare costs is to pay hospitals less. But we didn't do a lick to change productivity. So all I do now is say, hey, hospitalists, instead of 10 patients, you're going to go to 15. And ICU doctor, you're going to go from 10 bed unit to a 20 bed unit. And nurse, you're going to care for eight patients because we have to manage our budget. But we've tapped that workload. I mean, and and so burnout is really, really real so there's a physical workload but even deeper is the demoralization that i'm a cog in a wheel and i can't change the system i can't tell you when we started this cus program like bob walker said every one of these docs say or nurses and eh, no one's going to listen to me right i mean I, I can't i'm not empowered we had one hospital the chair of cardiac surgery so very powerful position we we're having these conversations and he took pictures of a dirty operating room that he'd been carrying around with him in his scrubs and threw them on the table and said, this is why we have infections, the operating room's dirty. And I sit there and said, then why do you operate? I mean, if you know you're putting a patient's risk, go close the operating room. You have a lot of power. And his mindset was, I'm completely powerless. 